the very purpose that hell was created needs to be in your mind and will really take you back all the way to the foundations of the earth. Uh, and that's why even though we're reading Matthew 25 and verse 41, we are, uh, it is the very premise that we would realize that from the very beginning, uh, there is this place of hell, a place that, that, uh, at one time might have been broken into two parts, uh, a paradise and a place of torment. But as we consider hell a place of everlasting torment, notice that that place of everlasting torment, when it was created, and why. Matthew 25, verse 41, Then shall he, the Lord Jesus Christ, after he returns, say unto them on his left hand, the Gentile nations that, uh, that did not help the nation of Israel and worked against God's purpose for the earth. He says to them, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And what we did last time is we stopped to contemplate the very fact that hell wasn't created for man, that hell was created for the devil and his angels, and we began to speculate because there's a real problem that people have when they try to think that maybe there is no place of eternal suffering, eternal fire. And uh, one of the problems that they have is not only do they not understand the nature of God and the justice of God, that they don't understand the nature of man. And, uh, and the nature of man is that there is more to man than just a physical body that we walk around in. Hell itself was created not for the physical beings. It was created for spiritual beings. It was created for angels. And the reason it was created for them, because they have the kind of bodies that they have, they do have bodies, by the way, but the bodies that they have, we would consider a spiritual body and a body that never grows old, that doesn't physically die. And because these spirits exist forever, the ones who rebelled against God must be judged and must be put away from the presence of God and his kingdom. So God, who created the heaven and the earth, when there became a spiritual rebellion against him, he created a place for those spirits who rebelled against them where they're going to spend all eternity. Now, if you understand that that's the reason hell was created in the first place, and you realize that in this passage there's men that are going to be joining the devil and his angels in that lake of fire, then the next part of that is to realize that when God created man, there's something about man that's closely related to the angels. We looked at verses last week that talked about how man was created a little lower than the angels. And there's two ways to look at that. You can look at the creation of man and realize man is created just a little lower than the angels. That's how the Bible says it. But you could look at man and animal, and then that the only the implication is that man is created far above the animals. <laughs> if you want to classify, if you got angels here and animals here, the Bible seems to associate us just under the angels, so that we, you'd realize that man is not just a physical animal that walks this earth. There's a special part of man that even if he physically dies, there's a part of him that's going to exist. And just like the angels who exist forever have to be placed somewhere when they're in rebellion against God, there is a part of man, it's called a soul, that has to be put somewhere when that man dies if he's not going to be a part of God's uh, uh, renovated or uh, what's that, restor restored kingdom that's going to be in heaven or earth. So that took us back. Now that's we go to Genesis chapter six, uh, 3. Uh, let's go all the way to 1. <laughs> And if you're at one, flip a page and go to two. And here, here's like where we ended. In Genesis uh, chapter 2, God created man. Now, he, he just tells us in, uh, in chapter 1 that he did it. You given some extra detail in chapter 2 that when he created man, what he did. It says in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, just in that verse alone, I know that something special, that man is special in God's creation. Uh, the phrase that man became a living soul, I don't know just in that one verse how to understand that expression. Uh, and I'm not sure I, I know... <laughs> all the verses that I need to know to understand that expression, but I, but I know some verses. And that is, when God created man, that's uh, out of the dust of the ground, that's the physical part of man, that's his body. 
And God breathes into man the breath of life. God imparted to him a spirit of life. Breath is spirit. And then man becomes something, a living soul. And when man became a living soul, we know from other verses of Scripture that we'll look at in just a moment, that man has a triune part. We know from Genesis chapter 1, just flip over there, in verse 26, that man is different than animals. It says in, in Genesis 1:26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God, when God created man, he, he is said to have created man in his image. And we know God that God has introduced himself to us as being a triune being. And sure enough, when we search the scriptures, man is triune. He's three. He's not just a body. God didn't just put clay and, and this clay walks around. This clay has a soul and it has a spirit. And, uh, and, and some of those people who do not believe in a literal place of hell uh, where eternal punishment exists, uh, one of the things that they don't have a good understanding of is not only the nature of God and the justice of God, but the nature of man. Uh, some, some of them actually deny that there is a difference between your soul and spirit. Uh, but even that doesn't let them off the hook because there has to be a difference between your body and your soul. Uh, and, and, and we're created in God's image. And then in the explanation of how we're created, God breathes into man's nostrils the breath of life and man becomes a living soul. That, that whatever man is, he's different from the animals in that he is a living soul. And, and where we talked about last week is that as I go through the King James Bible, and, and I don't know quite how to, uh, uh, like, like if you went into the Hebrew language, it would almost indicate that living soul is just a living being. Uh, Lou, share with what you said. I haven't had time to check it out, so I'll let you be the authority on this. Go to the NIV and several others. When you read the life into the nostrils, they did not. They do not say that he became a living soul. They say he became a living being. Okay. And I believe there's a difference between a being and a soul. Yeah. See, in the Hebrew, when, when God created the animals, uh, there is, uh, the Bible, like I told you last week, the Bible doesn't use the word animals. It uses beast or uh, creatures. creatures. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to have to think from last week. Uh, it uses those two terms. It, and as I go through the Bible, soul is only related to man. So that this expression, a living soul, that man is different than the animals. Now, Now, in thinking about that, if soul only refers to man... The question always comes up, does an animal have a spirit and have a soul? Uh, and I, I was taught in Bible school that animals have a soul, but they don't have a spirit. And, uh, and, but when I searched the scriptures, I didn't find that to be true. Come over, hold your place in Genesis. Come to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. By the way, the book of Ecclesiastes says an awful lot that people who don't believe in hell like to go to Ecclesiastes. And, uh, and perhaps when we move along in our subject, we'll deal with some of the verses that they use to, in Ecclesiastes to say. And, and, but I'll tell you even now ahead of time, if you look at those verses, you'll keep seeing that there's a reference to the grave, to the grave, to the grave. Well, the only thing that ever gets put in, the bo in a grave is your body. Uh, nothing else, of, no other part of you gets put in a grave. And so in the grave there is no knowledge, there's no consciousness. Why? Because the body <laughs> doesn't have a spirit and soul in it. Uh, but the spirit and the soul go somewhere. But that's just getting a little ahead. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 in verse 21. It says, Who knoweth the, the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of a beast that goeth downward to the earth? Well, that verse just tells me that, the, that, that beasts have a spirit. It is interesting that the man's spirit goes upward. That must be to God who gave it. And the spirit goes uh, of an animal goes toward the earth. 
as if maybe the spirit just stops to exist. I'm not sure uh, the fact that, that spirit could just be the very breath of life itself, and it just goes into the earth, it's gone. But the spirit of a man, the Bible says, goes upward. Now, I, I just looking at this verse for the sake of realizing that that verse tells us the animals have a spirit. And I would challenge you to think the other way, other than what I was taught. Rather than think an animals don't have a spirit, I don't think animals have a soul. I think that when man became a living soul, he became something animals weren't. And they weren't a dead soul. They weren't a soul at all. They were, they were beings that God, if we could use that one, <laughs> they were beings that God created that have physical life. They have the breath of life. And they have a spirit to them. But they're not a living soul like man is. And, uh, and, and that's why as you go through the Bible, you'll find man always being called a soul because that's who he is in essence. And, uh, and he has a spirit of life in him. And he also has a physical body. Now, just come over with me to Matthew. Oh, uh, no, Luke. It'll be right here, all in Luke. Luke chapter 23. Some interesting statements in, in the, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ that would show you that man in his triune nature, that upon death, there's some things that separate it. Now, I, I hope you remember, last week we did look at the verse where it talked about, was it Rachel who was dying when she uh, gave birth? Yeah, was, <laughs> I get Rachel and Rebecca. It's Rachel, isn't it? Uh, gave birth to Benjamin, that as her soul was, uh, as, 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 when she was dying, her soul was in departing, for she died, the Bible says. So that when, when a person physically dies, their soul leaves. David said to God, Thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. That David, now the Holy One is Jesus Christ, but in David's case, his, his flesh did see corruption in a grave that his soul went to a place that's called hell, which at that point is, uh, this far in our study, is just the place of departed spirits. Because if your soul and spirit leave your body, it's got to go somewhere. Now, it's interesting that when the Lord Jesus Christ was dying, some of the expressions that he says, for instance, in Luke chapter 23, in verse 43, he's talking to the thief on the cross, and and uh, verse 42 it says, And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So he's asking, he's looking forward to the future kingdom. That's when the resurrection of Old Testament saints takes place. And he wanted Jesus Christ to remember him. He wants to be a part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, truly, I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So that the Lord Jesus Christ, this man's looking to the future, and the Lord is giving him a promise that's going to take place that day. That that day, that man is going to be with Jesus Christ in a place that's called paradise. Well, we know that Jesus Christ says that as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the, belly, uh, in the whale's belly, so the Son of Man will spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And down in the heart of the earth is this place that's called hell, that at the time when Jesus Christ died and throughout the Old Testament had two parts to it. Now, this will be, we know this from the teaching of Christ because he created this place. But what it is, is that hell is not necessarily a place of torment. There's a paradise part of it, and then there's a torment part of it. And Jesus Christ, when he died, he didn't go down and suffer torments of hell. He suffered the torments of hell on the cross. When he was done suffering on the cross, he said, it is finished. He didn't suffer more after that. He went to a place in the heart of the earth between death and resurrection. That means Jesus Christ himself, when they put him, his, his soul, when they put his body in the tomb, his, his soul was not there. His, his soul went down into the heart of the earth to a place of departed spirits. This man is also going to die, and that day he's going to be with Christ in the heart of the earth. You get down to verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. Well, the spirit of man goes where? 
upward. He takes and God who gave us the breath of life, I'm not sure what part of this is, but Jesus Christ, into thy hands I commend my spirit, and he gives up the ghost. His, his spirit goes back to God. His soul went to a place of paradise. And then when you get down to verse 52, it, it says, and this man that Joseph of Arathema, uh, uh, yeah, uh, says, uh, this man went unto Pilate and begged for the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid in a sepulcher that was hewn out of stone wherein never a man was laid. So the body of Jesus gets put in a sepulcher. Well, that's not the heart of the earth where this man was because that man physically wasn't with Jesus, buried with him in that sepulcher. Only the Lord Jesus' body was in there, but that's his body. His soul is down in a place called paradise and he commends his spirit unto God the Father. Man who is different than the animals, who has some relationship, something in common with angels, has a soul that's going to eternally exist. And when it departs from this body upon physical death, it's got to go somewhere. And it's going to go to a place of, of destiny, either a place of paradise or today with the Lord, or it's going to go to a place of eternal punishment, awaiting a final judgment at the great white throne where we saw already that, that angels or some angels are already chained waiting for that final judgment to come. And so man, his very nature, has, there has to be a hell because that soul's got to go somewhere for eternity. God gave it the breath of life, man became a living soul, and that soul is going to spend eternity somewhere. Now, um, just to show you that there is a difference. Go ahead. Yes, I can ask a question back. Would the definition of the spirit of an animal of necessity have to be different from the definition of the spirit of a, a, a human being since we define the definition of the spirit of a human being is the God consciousness? that we have, or are we saying no. that an animal has a God consciousness too, or? Yeah, no, right. Um, part of the, and, and I have to think, and I, and I can't do it on my feet, because it's, it, I always run into trouble thinking of the difference between when God said he, that we're to create man in our image after our likeness. There's a difference in those two things. Image, I believe, has the physical part, the likeness has to do with more of some of the internal attributes of God, which would be justice and love and, uh, and the consciousness of God. And I like what you said because it helped me in my thinking. If you would ask me a second ago, what's the definition of spirit, I would tell you the seed of intellect. And, and that, I can show you that from the Bible, but th that's, that probably isn't not all comprehensive of what the, soul, uh, the spirit is. Uh, because, and, and, but I can also see how animals have intellect. I mean, you can train a dog, you can train every kind of animal. It's amazing what you can do. So they do have an intellect. Uh, but, but certainly their intellect is not God conscious like ours. So I appreciate you saying that. Uh, also that I would say that the, basically the soul is the seat of your emotion, appetite, and will. Well, animals have some degree of will and some degree of emotion. I mean, you can beat a dog and he can cower down. I mean, he can really feel bad. You can see it the way he acts. And, uh, and certainly they have a will because that's what you're trying to control in, in certain kind of animals. And yet they don't have, they don't have that soul that God has given man. Uh, they're not called a living soul. Uh, and certainly they do have physical bodies. But, but my point was in here is just to make sure that you see clearly that even though some people cannot seem to separate in their mind that man is three different parts, spirit, soul, and body. The Bible makes it very plain that man is that way and that there's a difference. For instance, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And if these parts of man are different, then when we talk about physical death of a man, or we're going to talk about an eternal uh, uh, destiny of man, then, then we can't just think of, you know, like... The people who, who, who believe in like annihilation, all they can see is a physical being who physically dies. And uh, Pastor Jordan tells the story. He was on an airplane and talking to uh, some uh, doctor of, uh, uh, of some kind of professor at, at some college. And so he got witnessing to him and asked him if he knows where he's going to go when he dies. And the man says, absolutely. And Pastor Jordan was so stunned, says, oh, well, where are you going to go? And, and he says, well, I'm going to go to a grave and be dead like a dog. <laughs> well, I mean, intellect of man, that's, that's about what he thinks of himself, that he is really nothing but an evolved animal. 
Uh, when you read the Bible, man is not like an animal. He's more like the angels, but less than an angel. Uh, but yet man in his being is not just flesh. He is also spirit, as we saw uh, the implication from Genesis uh, uh, 6 last week. Uh, but here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, Paul says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And that's referring to your whole being. And now he's going to name your whole being. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that in your spiritual growth, and spirit is put first, that you grow spiritually, not just in your spirit, but also in your soul, in your emotions and in your will. Your spirit, you, you learn of the things of God. You're renewed in the spirit of your mind. And then in your soul, you, God works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure, that your soul is sanctified and for God's use. And then if your spirit is renewed and your soul is set apart or sanctified uh, for, to willing to do God's will, then, then it's God will use your body in this earth for his glory. And, and Paul's praying that you would get that way in your Christian life and to do that, there's, there's three parts of you that God's going to work in, spirit, soul, and body. Now, Hebrews chapter 4 is a real important passage in, in regards to this. Mr. Marshall, who taught here years ago and was one of the early founders of this assembly, wrote a book about, what do you call it, Dad, the soulish spirit or something like that, where he endeavors through a lot of language <laughs> to say that the soul and the spirit, there is no difference between the two. Now, I tried to read the book. It was real complicated. But it was real clear as I was reading that he was working of saying one plus one uh, uh, equals two unless such and such takes place. Now, he didn't use this illustration, but after reading, you know, several chapters, all of a sudden one plus one no longer equals two. And what it was is just a lot of complicated to confuse you for, from something very simple. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says this, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, that is, so it's, be able, it's able to cut, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Now, there's hardly, it, I have complications in my own limitation of language and my mind of understanding is how to differentiate consistently all the time between soul and spirit. Sometimes the Bible will use spirit in, a, in an emotional way, which throws off uh, some of, of the way I would think about things. So, so sometimes I am limited in my understanding. But according to this, the Bible is so sharp that it can take something so closely related as soul and spirit and make a division between the two. And the reason why, they're not the same. They're real close, and it's hard for us to understand the difference. We certainly would understand the difference between a body and a, and a spirit, or a body and a soul, but that soul and spirit are close, but there is a difference because the Bible can divide between soul and spirit. Uh, he, uh, and it says, and of the joints and marrow, now that's taking your bone and divided it into two parts, <laughs> and as a discerner of the thought and intents of the heart. See, sometimes you have a thought and then you have an intent behind the thought. <laughs> and the Bible can make the difference between those two things. Oh, all that is closely related together, but they're different, aren't they? And so they are different. Soul and spirit are different. And when a person physically dies, that soul must go somewhere because it, it is, according to the scriptures, going to eternally exist. And if it's in rebellion against God, it's going to be separated from God for all eternity. Now, go back to Genesis and, and go first to chapter 3. We'll come back to this because we want to spend a little bit more time. One of the things about the understanding of hell from an Old Testament point of view is first understand that the Old Testament saint must, well, we know from David, he had the concept of a different place that his soul was going to go from his flesh. His soul was going to go to hell, hell his flesh was going to be put in a grave somewhere. Uh, Old Testament saints look forward to resurrection, which if you think about it, if, the, if they're looking forward to resurrection, you need to think about this because this body isn't what's going to live forever. Man is going to live forever, right? Saved man is going to live with forever. 
A lost man's going to exist forever, but a saved man's going to live forever, but e eternal life isn't just this flesh. Because this flesh is going to die. And, and it's going to have to be erased from the dead and become a different kind of flesh for you to live forever. So, so Old Testament saints had a concept of eternal life, and they had a concept of eternal life not just being physically staying alive forever. They knew they were going to face death but be raised, and that between death and resurrection, that soul exists separate from the body and goes someplace. So that one of the things that the, that the early Old Testament saints, they had a knowledge that when you talked about death in your Bible, that you're not talking about a human being dying like a dog in a grave and in in, in being put in a hole somewhere and just stopping to exist. And, and it would go all the way back to the very beginning when Adam and Eve were put in that garden and, and God told man that the day that he eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what's going to happen to him? He'll, He'll surely die. And, and Eve tries to reiterate that to, uh, 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 to Satan in verse 2 of Genesis 3, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may not eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, or that we, we may eat, but, uh, but of, the tr of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat, it, eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now she might have added to God, well not might have, she did add about touching it, but she did understand that God made a statement that they were going to die. And, uh, and that he, what he said to Adam is that the day ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. In fact, I guess I should make sure you see the verse. Chapter 1. Or is it right here, 2? Oh, it's chapter 2, verse 16. Chapter 2, verse 16 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now he says, in the day that you eat of it, you're going to die. So she knows that if she eats of it, you're going to, they're going to die. Verse 4 of chapter 3 now. Satan says to Eve, and the serpent said unto, Eve, unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now you've got to make a determination here. Who's right, God or the devil? God says, the day that you eat of it, you're surely going to die. And then the Satan finally gets to the point where he says, you're surely not going to die. You shall not surely die. So you got to decide what's going to happen the day they eat of it. Now, I believe God, which then I believe man died the day he ate of that tree. It says uh, in verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave unto her husband and, and, and uh, her husband with her. And he did eat, and the eyes of them both were open, and they, they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And something took place in man. Now some people say that what this really means is that they're just going to begin to die and gradually die. And when you get to chapter 5, Adam lives 930 years and finally kills over dead. But God said, in the day they eat of, you're surely going to die. And, and if this was all you had in the Bible, maybe you could have that debate and go on. Did they die that day or did that day last for 930 years and he finally died? And, uh, but, but when you know when you come to Ephesians that you realize that God speaks about man being dead in another way. Not just physical death. The Bible says, and you being dead in trespasses and sins hath he quickened. So that before you and I get saved, God says we are dead. And Adam and Eve died that day, not in the physical sense that man is looking at, but another part of man died, and that was certainly a spiritual death that took place. His relationship with God was severed, and now man is, phys is spiritually dead, awaiting a physical death that's going to come as a consequence as well. And, and so there's a difference in death, and the death here is a spiritual death. And so you need to separate spiritual death, physical death, and the death of a soul. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And what death represents in the Bible, and this is what we'll, we'll take up another time, is death represents separation from God.
to die in your sins, you'll be sep eternally separated from God. And that's why a soul is called a lost soul, to lose your own soul. Now come over to Genesis chapter 4. We'll, we'll come back to that. Um, Genesis chapter 4. Here's another Old Testament concept. Uh, we'll probably not get to those King James verses. <laughs> By the way, when I get back from Pennsylvania that Sunday, the, the things I'm going to teach in Pennsylvania, uh, I'll be spending that Sunday going over with you so that all the work that, that you support me to do, you're not missing out on it and someone else getting the benefit. Uh, anyhow, uh, Genesis chapter 4. I wanted to go over this with you. This is the story of Cain and Abel where, where Cain, uh, his sacrifice was not accepted with God because uh, not only it was himself, God's a discerner of the thought and intent of the heart. <laughs> and so not only was the sacrifice of Cain not accepted, but Cain himself was not accepted with God as he tried to offer God works. Abel came by faith and brought what God required, and God accepted both Abel and his sacrifice because he came in faith. Well, God, who knows the thoughts and intents, he gave Cain an opportunity to do the right thing in verse 7, but here's the consequence of what Cain chose to do in chapter 4, verse 8. And Cain walked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I, uh, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? So he thought he could lie to God about it. And he said, uh, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And, and, and now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her, uh, her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Now, you, you, you know, you look at this and you say, Okay, he killed a man, and as a result of that, he's going to be a fugitive and a vagabond. And he said, Oh, that's, that's more than I can bear. Or did he somehow understand that it was more than just being a fugitive, a man on the run, and a vagabond, a wanderer, the rest of his life? Does the wandering, you know, the Bible speaks about the angels, and it makes a reference uh, about wandering stars and in the darkness as if there is a soul that's going to be alone somewhere forever. Uh, I, I don't know. I just, just think about that. But to be a fugitive and a vagabond, he, he starts to cry out, and he says that his punishment is greater than he can bear. Verse 14 says, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. For how long? How long does God exist? Yeah, it, see, the punishment that he is going to bear is not just a, a fugitive vagabond in the earth, but the, from the presence of God for all eternity. It says, uh, uh, from thy face shall, uh, shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto Cain, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. God says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. No man can go and kill Cain for the evil that he did. So vengeance is not, the vengeance of what Cain did to kill Abel is not up to any man to take. Now, is Cain, does Cain get away with murder? Is he like, now, excuse me in this, but an O.J. Simpson? Where you can kill, if O.J., and I say if, because in our law system he wasn't found guilty. But if he really did it and deceived the jury, and got away with murder, did he really get away with it? I mean, there's a sense in which O.J. is a vagabond and a fugitive. Everyone calls him a fugitive. And uh, I don't know how much he has to wander, but, uh, but watch what happened to Cain, verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east side of Eden. And Cain knew his wife. Abel never had a wife, did he? This man got married, had a wife, and conceived and bare Enoch. 
Abel never had a son. This man grows up and has a son and built a city and called the name of the city after his, uh, after his son Enoch. Well, that's a proud thing, isn't it? You know, a fugitive, a man on the run, he's got to go away from the presence of God. God's going to catch him someday. <laughs> this is not over yet. And then when it says a vagabond, well, if you're going to be a wanderer all the time, and especially if you can't grow crops because the ground's not going to yield to you and you're a farmer, well, if you build a city, then the farmer can come and sell his crops in the city and you don't have to grow the crops, do you? He, when you look at what Cain is doing in here, he's trying to overcome this judgment that God had pronounced on him that no man is able to go get revenge on Cain. And the question you have to ask, does Cain, did Cain get away? Is this, is that all the punishment is for murder? Where's the eye for the eye and a tooth for a tooth here? Where is vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord? Which, by the way, is an Old Testament passage. Well, the point is, Cain understands more about his judgment than you and I do, I believe. That there is an understanding here from the presence of God that he is going to be hid is an eternal thing that he is going to suffer. And the fugitive and the vagabond is eternal separation from God and God's kingdom for all eternity. And that this mark on Cain, no man can take the vengeance that God's going to take. And uh, I, I believe right from the beginning of the Bible that the concept of hell is understood in a greater way that when you and I understand from other things from the New Testament about the nature of man and the justice of God, then we can go back there and see that these people had some understanding that we just need to catch up with. Um, that's hell uh, just right from the beginning of the Old Testament. Mike? Well, probably that image of God, or not the image, the likeness of God, that justice needed to be served. Man knows that. When we get talking later, this is the stuff that... People today who are lost see someone do something hideous and they always cry for justice. They're lost people and they know something about justice. I don't think you have to teach that. It's part of that likeness of God that's in man. Animals don't think of justice. I mean, they kill an animal. They don't say, oh, I feel guilty. I killed that other animal. And another animal say, wait a minute, you killed that animal. We're going to have to kill you. They don't have that system. But man is different than an animal. And there's some likeness of God in us, even in our fallen state. So it's the part of the God created man. Yeah. Image and likeness, right. What? No. no. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we pray that uh, as we study this subject, that we will know more about the the nature of man, who we really are, and not be deceived by the evolutionary teaching today. May we also understand your nature and more about that image and likeness that we're created in about the regeneration that we have through your Holy Spirit, uh, but also, Father, that part of us that cries out for justice that is part of your nature as being a God uh, who is always right and, uh, and will make everything right when it all comes to an end. So, Father, help us to study and to see some things from your point of view and understand why there is eternal judgment, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen.